of the interesting, uh, uh, I, I guess, situations that we have is that our culture has changed a lot um, in terms of the speed of information that comes at us. And uh, we've all become uh, a world of, I guess, multitaskers. How does this affect our brains? Well, uh, there's at least two things in there, right? There's the speed at which the information comes at us, and then there's multitasking. So multitasking is an easy thing. Uh, women tend to be better at multitasking than men. It's probably uh, derives from the role of motherhood and doing a lot of things at once. I mean, if you, we, when, I, when I say that, I'm speaking in terms of evolution and hunter-gatherer um, situations and uh, but fast forward out of that situation into our modern information society um, you know multitasking is usually praised um, or posed as a, a challenge that we should rise to but when we've studied it in brain terms there is a switching time so and that switching time has a cost so every time you go back, let's say you're the typical person at an office with a computer screen with emails coming in kerplunk, kerplunk, and um, maybe some instant messaging to the front desk and a couple of things that are open. Each time you're going back and forth between those areas, part of the brain's got to shut down and shunt over excitation and blood flow, et cetera, to the other areas. And it's not really very efficient. Uh, put simply. And then the other issue is that to keep your brain in good shape, you have to be doing certain kinds of tasks that involve high level of focused concentration. So when, when children are born, you'll notice that they never have to furrow their brows to learn. They're great audiences, and that's because they're going through a critical period of plasticity when the focused circuits in the brain are always turned on. And one of the reasons we like to be around babies is because they're really cute. But another reason we like to be around them is because they're such great audiences to whatever silly thing we do with our hands or our smiles or our tickles. Because they're paying such rapt attention all the time because that focus part of the brain is turned on. And the neurons involved are called the, nuclei, the nucleus basalis. It's a group or a clump of neurons. And that's why they can learn languages. I mean, so many new words uh, a day, and you can throw any language you want at them, and they start to pick it up. At a certain point, and it varies for mental functions, those things turn off. And you can learn again. You can learn, obviously, in grade school and so on but you have to furrow your brow. You have to make a mental effort to do so. But the nucleus basalis gets a pretty good workout in school with French vocabulary tests and new math formula and all, and all that kind of thing, all the way up through university if you go to university or college. But most of us, by the time we hit middle age, and it starts a lot earlier than we'd like to admit, um, what happens is we don't put that nucleus basalis um, through its paces. We don't give it a really good workout. And it starts to atrophy or waste away. And because it starts to atrophy or, or waste away, um, it weakens. And that's when we start to have memory difficulties. So, but what we have learned is that if you can create situations where adults who are post-critical period can have really focused attention. Then they can really learn and consolidate connections that they keep. In, if you're multitasking too quickly, you don't have enough focused attention to keep the nucleus basalis in shape. So I've, I've given you a pretty long answer. But it basically means to maintain the circuitry and maintain your brain. Not even improve it, just to maintain it. You need periods of real good concentration. And if your job is demanding multitasking all day long, I think that's harder. Now, there's a second part of the question, which was, what about the speed of the information that's coming at us? So we have been endowed by evolution which, with something 
the Russian psychologist first described, as far as I know, which is called the orienting response. So if there is a loud noise, as when um, my uh, microphone thing <laughs> fell, or if somebody bursts into the room, um, it's very, very hard not to turn and pay attention to that. So that orienting response, um, in a way, is, is a way of getting under our skin. And the orienting response can be triggered as well by changes in point of view. For instance, if you're watching a television show and there's, you're looking at Jack Bauer from up close and then a little further back in 24, that triggers the orienting response, okay? It's almost irresistible. And in fact, it's sped up so much, as I describe in the book, that, I mean, just watch show from the 1960s, right, or 1950s and then look at something like 24 or your typical television commercial. There's a change of point of view or angle happening every second. In computer games, this is built in, and all the bells and whistles and in information technology are triggering our orienting response so that, you know, how many of you work in tall towers where you ride up in elevators and there's a television, okay, and it's ad advertising something basically, and you don't want, you say, I'm not gonna look at that damn thing and you get on the elevator, you're going to look at the people you're with. But it just doesn't happen. Everyone ends up looking at it because the orienting response is being triggered. Okay? Now, we are constantly having that triggered. But the orienting response goes with a degree of anxiety because it could be, it could be a predator. It evolved for that. It also could be a form of, if it's brightly colored, it might be some berries or some fruit that we're attracted to. Uh, it could be a sexual um, enticement. But a lot of the orienting response has to do with anxiety. So it's another component of us feeling wired all the time. And of course, we're all walking around with blackberries that make all sorts of sounds and say, pay attention, pay attention. Now, I would suggest that all that we have in life is our attention. It's your most precious resource. Uh, if you don't have that, you're not living your life. You're living somebody else's life in, in, to, to some degree, right? Um, and I, I see this as a kind of a crisis. Um, and of course, it, it's not just happening in the office place. But the, the thing about things like blackberries is, at first it looks like it's liberating. Hey, I don't have to, I can leave the office early today. Yes, you can but you can be a slave 24-7 going forward, right? And so our, our attention is, we are losing control of our attention, in some ways our most precious resource. I mean, if I said you could be alive, but you couldn't have control of your own attention, that wouldn't be a, a great deal, would it? So I think it's making a lot of people kind of crazy. <laughs> Not in this room, just other people out there a little I mean, crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's gone so far as, you know, there was a time, like for instance, you know, I'm a psychoanalyst as well, and so the consulting room is a, a, a sanctuary where you can come and people make fun of analysts for not talking a lot. I guess you could imagine, sometimes I, I talk to my patients, but in general I listen first, and a lot, and that's where people consist sort of explore what's going on and everything they're reacting to. And you know, a few years ago it started to be the case, uh, you know, because I'm a physician, I treated a lot of doctors and I treated a lot of medical students. So I was used to, you know, maybe one in four, my surgical resident patient would have a pager, you know, in the 80s. And they'd say, look, I've got to leave this on. I really should be at the other, this was in New York, at the other part of the hospital, I'd let them leave it on, but it was a rare event. Now it seems everyone and everybody it comes into the office and they have to be taught to turn their cell phones off in their own sessions. And they've, and, but here's the key point. When they say no, they say they have an emergency. But they're defining what an emergency is down so low <laughs> that, you know, it could be that my kid might be waiting five minutes, you know, at school. Or, I don't know the person who's come to shampoo the dog might be knocking outside, you know? <laughs> and so I take that as really significant, that people are, as they become wired into the situation, into, into the wired world, 
they define emergency down. And they're getting anxious about really nothing, right? But is it, am I making this up? Or do some of you experience this? Mm -hmm. With perhaps your teenagers at dinner who can't turn the machine off because they've got to know who's texting them. And there's, there's a lot of anxiety there too. Because you know when people are checking their texts, like teenagers are checking, they're basically saying, who loves me? Who loves me? Who still loves me? Does anybody love me? It's, it's not just neutral ex examination of material. Well, sometimes with my son, it's, you know, since he's into football, uh, it might be about statistics. But it's a sign we've, our, our nervous systems have, as Marshall McLuhan said, he said that, you know, the electronic media basically extend the human nervous system across the world. And everyone thought he was speaking metaphorically, and so did I, until I understood plasticity. And I realized he isn't, because both of them are electronic, sig electronic signaling systems. And we, are, we take to it because, um, um, and we collude with it, because they're very, very compatible. They're, they're not identical, but they're very, very compatible. But the problem is, as again that genius McLuhan said, is media may, he called the understanding media, the extensions of man was the title of his, his perhaps most well-known book. They don't just extend man, but the media implode into us. Um, and they, they start, that's how, and because our brains are plastic, we get rewired. So, I mean, when I was traveling around, the first thing that I became aware of was how much more resilient our brains are in terms of plastic, flexible, modifiable um, than people, particularly clinicians, had come to believe. But I also realized that to be, you know, not all changes for the good. You know, if you're the incumbent in a political race, changes for the bad. And in the brain, change can be for the bad, too. And so what we do with our brains can influence them for better or for worse. I mean, addictions are a, a, a function of neuroplasticity gone awry. Chronic pain syndromes are signs that you know, the brain is getting tickled by a nerve that's slightly pinched all the time. And it starts off that only when you move oh, do you get that lance of pain. But if that tickle keeps going long enough, you don't even have to move because the brain map gets so good at processing the slightest hints of pain that it's, you're now experiencing it 24-7 and not just in the little part of your back that's hurting. It expands the map so that literally the topography of the area that's painful grows. That's negative plasticity. So um, I think there is a problem with the speed at which things are coming at us. And I think it forecloses a certain amount of res um, reflection. I guess there's some interesting implications then for individuals as well as companies to think about um, the sort of uh, the work, the process flow that their that their staff has, the you know the amount of time that they can take. Where, you know, if if a company would allow you to not have your BlackBerry on at all times, the kind of opportunities that that might um, that that might uh, might give. Oh, I think that they would be huge. I, I think that the, I mean, there's just an incredible, well, there's several things to keep in mind. First of all, brain plasticity underlies all learning, and all jobs involve a certain amount of learning. But there, you, you require certain quiescent times in which to consolidate the learning you've done. So the system can't be on constantly. Um, and if you want creativity from your employees, you have to create situations for them when they're not being imploded upon by constant demands. Nobody can see. Oh. Hello? Oh, he's yeah. imploding. <laughs> okay. Nobody can okay. switch into that creative zone, you know, on a dime. And I mean, there's other things. For instance, um, if you want to improve employee creativity, I, I, I'm not saying this because it's trendy. I, 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 they're the really good studies now. We know that brain plasticity can be enhanced not just by cognitive exercises, as you know, we, we're now doing with kids with learning disorders, 
but by physical exercise. And so the man who discovered, for instance, after about 100 years of scientists looking for signs of new cells in the brain, that in fact there are some baby stem cells in the brain, um, started studying that in, in, in rats and mice. And basically what they learned was the following that the part of your brain that turns short-term memory into long, which is a crucial part of the brain, it's the kind of, it's part of the brain that we, we think is not working well in Alzheimer's, for instance, that part of the brain can grow new cells, but the way it does it is through physical exercise. And the exercise it does it is basically fast walking. And the theory that Fred Gage proposed for that was, when would an animal do lots and lots of fast walking? Well, when it changes its environment, when there's no food left in this place, or there are predators here. So if it's going to a new environment, it's leaving explored territory, and going into unexplored territory, where it's going to have to do a lot of learning. So that's, seems, that's a story. It's a scientific story. I find it extremely compelling as to why exercise might do that. It also triggers all sorts of the equivalent of brain fertilizers, a brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which helps consolidate plastic connections. So really, and, and on many, many counts, one of the best things you can do not only for yourself, but your employees, is, for their brains and their cognitive capacities, as well as their moods, is what was done in certain US schools that were inner city schools that were failing terribly. They actually got the kids to come to school, first half hour, they did fitness, meaning not sports and games, but their own fitness programs, usually on running or walking machines. And one of the schools in the States, which was just, um, had terrible discipline problems and was just at the very bottom cognitively, now actually finishes typically number one in math throughout the world and number six, five or six in science. And we know that IQ actually goes up in the period after you do that kind of a workout. So, you know, we didn't evolve to be, um, you know, geeks in front of screens all day long. We evolved to be hunters and gatherers and moving. And our brains are so dependent on movement. I mean, just to give you an example of this, there's, there's one of these sea animals that... Um, you think of butterflies, it has different phases in its life. And in the first phase of its life, it's basically moving around the sea floor to find its most appropriate abode. And then when it finds its abode, and, and this, this is a sea creature that has a brain and a nervous system, and it settles down, it locks somewhere on a rock under sea. And what do you think happens next? Its brain melts away. <laughs> It doesn't need it anymore because new environments require, you know, require something that can assess all of that new information. So there's another thing that people can do. Um, you know, I think it was in the 1920s that you know, at the height of industrialization, which was really a period of time when work was so-called rationalized and factories were developed and instead of having one person, I don't know, making a home and doing all the tasks themselves or with their friends. We, we had, you know, increasing division of labor. And human beings were turned into cogs, right? Each doing one particular thing along the way. And in a way, what that is, is that's the machine metaphor playing out in our lives. The one I talked about, the mechanized view of nature has been now draft, you know, sketched onto human beings and human behavior. And it obviously creates some problems. But one of the things that always caught my attention was the efficiency experts would come in. And I remember once I was c consulted by the government about this, and there was um, a, an efficiency expert who came in, and he was ta talking about getting all the fat out of the system. And um, he hadn't done that for himself. But he was just loved that metaphor. And just as a doctor, I thought, 
does he realize what, why fat is in the system? You know, we actually need fat in our systems. We've kind of demonized fatty tissue in some ways. But it's really there for a reason, because nothing ever goes smoothly in life. So we need these resources for the, the inevitable bumps. But if you imagine human beings and industry and everything is just like a machine, um, which, of course, things always go wrong, uh, you want to, quote, demonize the, the so-called fat in the system. But in brain terms, these downtimes are really creative you know, creative times and important times. And I really think that, you know, all the psychological studies that have done about locus of control in organizations where people feel they have no say in what's happening and they're, they're treated like things and cogs um, show that the organizations don't do as well and the people actually get sicker and healthcare costs go up. I really liked the, uh, the story that you told about the, the sea creature whose brain melted when they got sedentary, and I've felt that way sometimes myself <laughs> in front of my computer if I sit there too long. Um, and again, if we do have volunteers that can be up here, just wave your hand if you've got a question. Okay, perfect. I've just got one more here, and then we'll go to the question there. Um, so uh, researchers like yourself are getting very good at fixing problems with people's brains. Um, Don Cherry, of course, was in the news two weeks ago, and it's been a big topic. There are those in professional sports, like hockey players, who are continually damaging their brains. Uh, what lies ahead then, uh, if we are able to fix people's brains more than we were before, how does that influence what we might do in terms of policy or trying to protect people from brain mm -hmm. injuries? Well. Um, I spend a lot of time talking about how people who were told they would not get better or they would be incurable turn out to make incredible amounts of progress despite that. You know, that much being said, I'm not sitting here hoping that I can have a stroke so that I can prove to you I can work my way out of it. <laughs> that is like really a brain catastrophe. And getting out of these things is, is, is really tough and it's, you don't always get out of them. But the, the, the neurological nihilism meant that we weren't even trying on many people who it turns out could be helped. So I'm not saying the brain is infinitely plastic. I mean, you really have to do a case-by-case -case examination, but it's far more plastic than we believed. But I'm not a utopian about it. So, I mean, the whole issue of hockey and football is, is one that I've turned a lot of attention to because I have found a number of treatments now that I'm in the process of investigating that I have no doubt can help traumatic brain injury. But that much being said, I mean, I'm, there are a lot of hockey lovers here, and I would say to all of us who love hockey, you know, we can't truly love the national sport without really caring for the hockey players themselves. And the thing about concussions, which is what you see most of in hockey, is they're sometimes called mild traumatic brain injury. Well, it makes me kind of laugh, because Mild compared to what? Like a major traumatic brain injury is you're in the ICU and you're given about three days to live. A mild traumatic brain injury is very frequently life destroying. I mean, you can lose your memory, you can be hypersensitive to sound for the rest of your life, you can have epilepsy, chronic headaches. Like when doctors who are used to seeing such damage use the term mild, like, you know, if it's your brain, I, I don't think you should celebrate it. And the thing about concussions is, I mean, you know, there's an epidemic of concussions, and they're often called mild. Why? Because first of all, you don't have to lose consciousness if you have a concussion. The second thing is that, so, you know, people say, are you okay? And because you haven't lost consciousness and the brain doesn't have pain fibers in it, you can say, yeah, I'm okay. Well, then, okay, get back on the ice and play. But here, here are the stats. You know, I think the biggest study that was done was done at Chapel Hill, North Carolina, on 2,550 uh, football players and um, who previous football players. And here's what they found: that if they're between ages 30 and 49, they have a 19-fold 
increase in Alzheimer's and memory problems. So 19-fold increase. So of those 2,500 people, 61% of them had one or more concussions that they knew of. Now, the other thing about concussions is they don't, you know, mild TBIs or traumatic brain injuries, is they don't show up on many of the conventional kinds of scans that we have in emergency departments or many hospitals. And sometimes they don't even show up on fairly advanced ones. You need some very, very advanced ones because they're happening microscopically and the brain's bouncing around inside the head and it can be, lead to subtle shearing sort of forces that um, disengage things. And if you looked at those same football players, and I think the same will go for some of our hockey players, um, once they hit 50 years of age, they have a five times increase in um, incidence of Alzheimer's and related uh, brain problems. So, I mean, this is serious, serious business. And, of course, what goes on in the ice in the NHL affects the minor leagues and affects what kids are doing to each other in high school, etc. And I think if we care about the sport, we're going to stop this. Uh, we're going to find a way to stop this and protect the kids. I'm not a person who's faint-hearted about manly virtue. I don't mind if, if there's a certain amount of you know, rough-and-tumble play. In fact, it's absolutely necessary for boys to experience it growing up. But, um, you know, this is a very high-speed sport, and it's, it's definitely changed its nature in the last 30 years. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, coliseum and gladiatorial stuff that's been thrown into hockey. And I don't think anyone's been serious about it. And frankly, to go to another part of the question, which was, now that we can fix the brain, how will it affect things? Yeah, like, I I'm sitting here in a moral quandary right now because I actually know a fair amount about fixing TBI now. And, you know, I think of Sidney Crosby too. And all those other kids who have, you know, gotten into this situation. And what do I do? Do I tell those doctors who are working for the teams, not for Sidney Crosby when he's 40 or 50, here are some techniques that will help him get back on the ice so that he can have another TBI. Because we, we know it's cumulative too, right? So it's really, it's, it's this is a public sort of debate that's really important in a country like Canada because for a lot of these people there is going to be no turning back and what we need are older athletes, people that um, don't seem like they're wimps and sucks, not just nervous Nelly doctors like me who you know, join, join together with nervous Nelly doctors like me to you know, protect our kids. Got a question there on that side, and we got one up at the front. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks very much, <clears throat> Leah, uh, and uh, thank you, Dr. Deutsch, very much for coming to Vancouver. Uh, my name is Michael Walker. I've spent uh, 40 years doing research on uh, on people's behavior with regard to economics. And uh, for a very, very brief moment in your introductory comments, when you talked about the woman who uh, had half a brain and went out to vote, I thought, ah, finally an explanation for the NDP. Uh, but, uh, uh, but that was only for a very brief moment. Actually, actually, um, I, wanted, I want to tell the story with the indulgence of the audience here, because it, I think the reason why you're here to, in some ways uh, stems from my own book club, which is a, a group of 16 people that meets regularly. and. Uh, because I have a friend who has a son with uh, OCD, uh, with obsessive compulsive disorder, who gave me a copy of your book, which I read, I introduced it to my book club, and one of the members gave a copy to, to Leah. Now, what is very fascinating about this is that the book club, the three of the people in the book club were immediately affected in a, in a, in a practical way by your book. And so there was a great deal of excitement amongst this group of people about your book and about the possibilities of neuroplasticity. And so one of them was a very distinguished business person here in Vancouver said, you know, we need to go out to the brain center at UBC and find out more about this stuff. 
And so we hit it off out to the brain. He made an appointment with the director out there, and the director himself came and gave us a big presentation about the work going on at the, at the, at the Brain Institute at, at UBC. Not one word about neuroplasticity, in spite of the fact that he knew the reason we were there is because we'd all read this book about neuroplasticity. So what I, my, my first question to you is, are we going to have to solve this problem one funeral at a time? I mean, are these people they're just coming from an old tradition and they just have to die out before the new stuff comes in? Or what, do you, what, what have you been doing uh, that might be uh, transplanted to, to, to these environs so that, we, that these important business people who might have given literally millions of dollars to brain research were turned off by the fact that this, brain, this important brain center was not at all concerned about the subject of your book. Uh, the second question I would put to you, and uh, it's, a, it's a slightly different one, and maybe we have to invite Steven Pinker to come out sometime to, I know you know, you know Steven Pinker, uh, and that is the, the contrast between his view that all of our brain functions have evolved, in fact our psychology and, and so on have evolved over a long period of time uh, and are, are the product of evolution uh, compared, to, uh, compared to plasticity. Maybe that's too far from the Knights uh, thing. But I would ask you please to tell us something about progress in getting these academic institutions to turn their attention to the issues of plasticity and the promises of plasticity. Yeah. Well, <sighs> academic institutions are like human institutions everywhere. You know, goals are formed at a certain point. People. Um, invest in certain projects, and when they meet with investors, they want help with those particular projects. Um, so that's human all too human. Um, but there are, the way it's worked is the plastic, there are a few places that are devoted to plasticity research, but not many. Most of the researchers are sprinkled throughout many different fields, because again, this is counter to the established paradigm. But I know there are people at UBC who are interested in plasticity, um, next time, send those investors my way. Uh, but, you know, you just, it, it's just a matter of you, you have to know where to look. And, but I can't emphasize to you the extent to which, look, this is cutting edge and it's been an uphill battle. And I didn't really, I chose for rhetorical reasons not to go into the extent of the opposition that the individual neuroplasticians I described faced because... I wrote the book at a moment in time when plasticity was only understood in certain domains. And I felt if I started naming all the names of all the people that attacked them, they would get really defensive. And it would be counterproductive to my goal, which was to bring the news about plasticity to as many people as possible in a way that would... Um, academics and neuroscientists would also appreciate and approve of. But I, I think it's, it's not maliciousness. There are many worthwhile projects that people are invested in. You just have to know where to go. The second thing about Steven Pinker, Steven Pinker is one of the few academics um, who, at least about 10 years ago, in his book, The Blank Slate, you know, he's an evolutionary psychologist, and he emphasizes he, that a lot of the modules that we as adults have, well, he's a kind of evolutionary psychologist. He can speak for himself about that, but I think that's what he is. But many of the modules that we have, the brain modules, um, are, you know, were formed in, you know, prehistoric times. And so if you want to explain brutish behavior um, or certain things that seem unrational. You, you go back to when they might have been adaptive, but also other forms of adaptive behavior, the sexual behavior, and so on. And in the book, he, it's, which, you know, to, to be fair, was written about 10 years ago, he said that he felt that the studies of brain plasticity showed it was really on the outer cerebral cortex, and it wasn't significantly distributed through the brain. And... It's true that at the time he wrote, many of those studies uh, were of the outer cerebral cortex, which is, you know, the, especially at the front is the later part of the brain. So the idea was some of the brain's adaptive, but fundamentally it's not that adaptive. But the reason that they were done on the outer side of the brain is most of the, f the first major window into plasticity involved using microelectrodes, 
which can't go deep in the brain. But in my book, if you, if you check the chapter on love, you'll see I go through this, what's called the subcortex and other parts of the brain, and I show wherever we have looked, we have found that the brain is plastic. And indeed, it would be very hard for plasticity to be ghettoized in just one part of the brain, because if one part of the brain changes, right, and the part downstream from it can adapt to the new kinds of signals it's getting, right, there's going to be gridlock in the brain. So really, plasticity is distributed you know, throughout the brain, and it may vary somewhat in degrees in different parts, but I would just say that perhaps one of the greatest of our evolutionary endowments, you know, from our hunter-gatherer and even prehistoric times, is the plastic brain. Plasticity existed in ancient times. It exists in animals, too. And the evolutionary psychologists have not taken that sufficiently into account, so I respectfully disagree with them. <laughs> well, we've been overwhelmed with a phenomenal number of questions. Some of them are sort of uh, similar, so uh, excuse me if I paraphrase. I'm going to ask a few, and then we've got another live question here in the front. I'm also conscious of people's times, um, so uh, I'll just blaze through a few very simple questions, such as uh, these ones. Is there a difference between the number of brain cells between men and women? And uh, uh, the second one is, does the female brain have more connections between both sides of the brain? And if so, can men learn how to have more connections? That was the third one I just threw in there. And if so, can my Frank learn <laughs> yeah, how to have more right. connections? David, how many don't want to talk about it? <laughs> um, well, yes. Studies show that the left and right hemispheres of women's brains are more connected. Um, through something called the corpus callosum. So they're, yeah, um, score, score one up for women on that. Um, it's not just the number of brain cells that are fundamental because, you know, there's 100 billion of those, but each of them have 1,000 connections. And by the way, the nerve cells in the brain, the neurons in the brain, only represent 15% of the cells inside your skull. There's a whole other brain in there, if you will, made up of what are called glia cells that were thought, ridiculously perhaps now, to be packing material that sort of, you know, were support staff for the neurons. But now we discover that the glia have certain communicative abilities too. So 85, in some ways we've missed 85% of the brain um, because we just focused on the neurons. And the signaling that's going on in the glia may be of a different kind, and we've only just begun to crack that one. Given the ideas um, presented in your book and some of the comments about uh, attention spans, would you allow children to play video games and or watch TV regularly? I would limit it. I would, so regularly is if, you know, I, I, Less regular, than 16 hours a day. Well, look, at, right now, <laughs> For, for, I mean, some of this is based on what I know as a physician. Some of this is what I know as a humanist. And my val the fact that I value literary culture. And I think that I favor literary culture over electronic culture for a number of reasons. But I think many of, th this is a long discussion, but this is again something McLuhan was very good, I think, at illustrating is that much of our political system, our sense of linear, linear, linear logic comes from books um, and the beginning of writing um, because in a book, you know, you read in a linear way, page by page, you can stop, you can look, you can examine it, whereas the electrical world comes at us all at once in many respects. And, you know, it's multimodal, it's coming all at once. And so, there's the notions of objectivity come to some degree out of writing and, I mean, read McLuhan and see if you agree or not. So I am concerned about that. I mean, the stats have just come out in a very large study that show that kids are now, North American kids are now spending something like seven and a half hours in front of screens, take all screens every day. And Adults are more like nine hours. Again, it's increasingly a knowledge-based, information-based economy, and people are trapped in front of screens. They were meant to move, 
And so I think this is the, probably the number one reason why obesity is going up so rapidly in uh, the Western world and now even in, in Japan. Uh, so this, this screen culture is having a profound impact on mind, brain, and body. I think we've got a microphone here for, for a thing. Um, it's interesting that you say that. I was actually quite heartened, though, that in your book, if I interpreted this correctly, that if we imagined ourselves exercising, our muscles physically actually got stronger. So I'm thinking that might counteract some of our screen culture. If well, we're just imagining ourselves exercising, it evens out, doesn't it? Um, well, look, what happens is, <laughs> what, what happens is, if you imagine doing uh, various, let's say, motor actions, there's, I would say that the motor firing circuits are trained inside your brain so that when you go to do something, you can um, show more strength. And that has to do with the fact that, you know, muscles are not all about size and bulk. All you have to do is hang out with a Tai Chi master who has muscles. The, idea, the ideal in Tai Chi is to have muscles even if you're a warrior, that hang on your body as soft as the flesh of babies. And they don't have big, huge muscles. But they're, they have a profound understanding of the economy of how force works and strength works, etc. So just by coordinating movements properly, you can actually be stronger without bulking up. So um, I, I think you still have to work out. <laughs> This uh, Dr. Deutsch, thank you for your presentation this evening. A um, uh, local NHLer who's recently retired, uh, Paul Korea, the gentleman that I played hockey with growing up, and, I, and after multiple concussions during his NHL career, 15 year career, he finally retired. And I saw an interview with him uh, about two months ago. I was absolutely fascinated with his response. He said he'd been brain tested from the beginning time of his career right through, uh, and, and he had suffered some pretty severe concussions, and he retired, and was contemplating trying to come back, um, and he tried a lot of different things. One of the things that he spoke uh, emphatically about was the fact that he'd come across a natural path, the individual who gave him uh, large doses of omega, or vitamin A, and he claims that he went from roughly a 52% capacity vis-a-vis -vis his early stages of, uh, uh, of his career when he was, when he was tested uh, back up to 87% uh, over the course of about a year. And he still, at that point, decided it was best to retire and not come back. Just any thoughts on something as simple Vitamin A or yeah. Omega? I haven't looked into vitamin A, but Omegas, I have, I suggest to all my patients and everybody who cares about the brain, be it healthy or ill, that they basically are on an Omega preparation. But if you, if you use one, you've got to make sure that it's properly filtered so that it doesn't have heavy metals in it. Um, so, because that can build up and cause brain and all sorts of metabolic problems. But definitely, yeah. And I took my equivalent of four to six grams today. Ooh, good advice. And it's also good for your heart and anti-inflammatory. It's, it's all, I've been following the studies on that for years. And um, I mean, there's now thousands of them. Thank you. Have there, uh, I'm very conscious of our time because we still, uh, and we've got so many questions that we can also address in our salon conversation um, after the event. So I'm just gonna ask two more, we'll, we'll do them quickly and then we'll continue the conversation afterwards. Have there been any successful studies showing positive changes using neuroplasticity in the brains of psychopaths, psychological liars, narcissistic people? My friends. <laughs> uh, not really. I mean, the short answer is not really. And the thing about neuroplasticity, which is a, a thing I kind of like about it, again, it's, it's that property of the brain that allows it to change structure and function through mental experience, is, you know, a person's got to be motivated. I mean, it's just like the, you know, the old jokes. Um, you've got to be motivated to do these changes. So, um, 
some people who go on to become psychopaths, well, some people who have psychopaths who are psychopaths actually do, are missing parts of their brains that allow to, one to empathize. Really hardcore psychopaths. Other people have you know, come up in extremely tormenting, traumatic situations. So you have to unpack all of that. And some of those kids, if you get them young, with you know, sort of attachment-based, psychological, psychoanalytic, relational therapies, if you know what you're doing, you can help them. But not all of them. But, there has, but these are techniques that have been around for a while. So there, but you know, the big problem in dealing with you know, some, not all, you can't generalize, but some people, is if you give them sort of psychotherapies, you can just train them to be better psychopaths. Because if they really just want to screw people, that's, you know, they'll, they'll say, oh, now I, I realize I just wasn't doing that facial position for remorse quite long enough. You know? <laughs> and, but insofar as these problems, like the narcissistic personality problems, some kinds of lying are developmental. Earlier interventions, um, are going to be more promising. Uh, and so that's perfect segue into our last question then about early intervention. So if you had any advice for educators um, based on the information that you've presented, what might it be, which ties into, you know, what would you change in the educational system then? Um, for example, would you have courses where they did one course uh, very focused instead of flipping back and forth in a day between five or six or eight topics? You know, you can do some flipping. What, what, I've, what I've found is if there's a creative component to something, there's a unit of time that's something like 90 minutes to 120. Um, this will be in my next book, so I don't have time to explain it, where the brain cycles through a number of things. Um, and so it really depends on the kind of course. But if it's more creative, I think you'd want it a longer thing. Um, I mean, if I had to do... You know, if I was like the Minister of Education for a single day and I could make a policy change, is I would have certain brain-based assessments done of kids roughly around grade one when um, they're far enough along the line that you could pick up a lot of learning disorders. Learning disorders are huge. And I mean, they're just, they cause so much pain and damage. And they range from kids who have multiple areas of learning dysfunction to people who are functioning pretty well, but they have a few glitches, but it's just in the wrong area for them. You know, the, per the person who wants to be a professor of history who can't learn languages because there's just one part of their brain that has to do with decoding sound that's not working. Or a person who might be a great lawyer, but they have an issue speaking you know, in public because of a brain glitch. And these things are really, a lot of them can be, can be fixed. And then of course there's the kids who are just, in an information society, you have to be able to decode signals. I, I'm sorry, symbols, like you know, mathematical symbols and word symbols. And we didn't evolve to live in an information society. It's just something that was invented. But kids who have glitches with that, and they, they might not even be, quote, pathological simply, simply. You know, they just, in a hunter-gatherer society, it wasn't necessary. These kids make far less money when they graduate. They're far more prone to depression, far more bro prone to drug abuse. So I would like to wipe, we, we could wipe that out. Well, that's actually a very inspirational way to end the evening. Um, to formally thank our speaker, I'd like to, well, first of all, let's give you a round of applause and then we'll get into this. Thank you.